So if we're going to start examining personal issues and their impact, I want all the details, John. I want them all. I want to know what's going on, because this is disgusting what they're doing to Terry Francona. Best team ever. The Boston Red Sox were destined for greatness in the spring of 2011, and as summer drew to a close, they stuck to the script. Top of the American League East on September 1st. Seven wins, 20 losses later, Boston missed the playoffs altogether, making history for all the wrong reasons. Just one of the bigger disappointments in Boston sports history, really, was that 2011 Boston Red Sox team. The thing I remember most about the collapse was the final night of the season, how it's playing out in Baltimore, how it plays out in Tampa, the dramatic ending to what was a horrible September was remarkable. I don't know that we had ever seen anything really like that. Fans were pissed and they should have been. I mean, it was a really, it was kind of a, to me, one of the real low points in Red Sox history. They have spent 320 million the last two years and don't have a playoff appearance. They deserve to blow this game because all year long there's been something structurally wrong with this team. The question marks go well beyond Carl Crawford and John Lackey. Terry Francona, does he have a job? For a team to be that good, to be that far ahead, and fall apart that badly, something had to be really wrong, and there was. There was something really wrong. On October 12th, the Boston Globe published a bombshell report by Bob Holer, taking readers inside the Red Sox clubhouse. Unearthed were indifferent players more focused on eating chicken and drinking beer than winning ball games and a lame duck manager whose life appeared to be spiraling out of control. There was this turmoil in the Red Sox organization like there can only be with the Red Sox. It was completely falling apart. And the story that put the whole thing over the top was the Boston Globe story that had details on Frank Conner. Bob Holer was the author. Okay, that was a show beyond belief. They should have just taken the high road. Instead, this story from Holder had all kinds of sordid details about Francona's marriage disintegrating, his reliance on painkillers. I thought it was a massive takedown. Just, you see what we've been dealing with and we had to let the guy go. And I thought it was just the kind of thing that uh, was as low grade as, as anything I've ever seen the Red Sox do. When there's a story like that, you spend like three or four days on it, just picking at the carcass. By probably day two or day three, you know, the knives get sharpened and you've got to dig a little deeper. And that's when we started, I think, going at Henry a little bit, and that probably got his attention. Next level. That is the lowest of the low. And I'll tell you what, if, Jimmy, let's get John Henry's ex-wives on the phone and see if we can get him into the program to discuss what types of issues he may have been dealing with at home while managing the team. I want to know, because he's on number three right now, right? Listening to the blistering commentary of 98.5 The Sports Hub's Mike Felger and Tony Maserati, principal owner John Henry had heard enough and decided to take matters into his own hands. As legend has it, John Henry uh, had a driver, said, take me to uh, 98.5 The Sports Hub walks in the building and Lee Dickman is sitting at the front desk. Lee Dickman was what we used to call the director of first impressions at CBS Radio Boston. For lack of a better phrase, word, he was the receptionist when you walked into the main lobby at 98.5 The Sports Hub, which was the home of several other radio stations in our cluster. Lee doesn't know a baseball from a grapefruit. Like, he's just not a sports fan. We're on the bottom floor of like four stories. The receptionist is up on the top floor. That's where you enter at street level. And John Henry walks up to our receptionist, Lee Dickman, who says, uh, I'd like to be on the radio. Shortly after Henry's visit, Lee Dickman explained his side of the story on radio station Mix 1041. So Friday afternoon, two people walk in and there's one person, he's very suited up and kind of professional looking. So this very skinny man comes up to the desk and looks at me and just says, I would like to be on the air. I was like, what air? And he was like, the sports hub. And I'm like, Lee says, well, who are you? 
And John Henry says, well, I'm John Henry. And Dickman says, and I'm Lee Dickman. What does that mean? He said, I'm Lee Dickman. <laughs> it, the, the line's immortal, I think. Normally, I would have been like, well, you know, can't do that. You need an appointment, something along those lines. Right. But he, <laughs> he radiated importance. Right. So I'm like, one second. So the phone rings, I pick it up, and it's Lee. And I, and I remember Lee saying, there's, there's somebody out here that wants to get on Felger and Maz's show. His name is John Henry. He says John Henry wants to get on uh, Felger and Maz. So I said, okay, I'll, uh, all right, I'll be right up. Let me just see what's going on here. So as I'm going up the steps, I start thinking, John Henry, is John Henry out front? I'm like, no, it, it can't be him. So the assistant program director, Rick, comes up to the top of the stairs, takes one look at who's standing in the lobby, looks down at the ground, <laughs> composes himself, <laughs> and introduces himself. Because he knows it's John Henry, the owner of the Red Sox. Exactly. And he knows John's mad. Right. So I took them downstairs, and I remember I said to him, okay, look, I need to give these guys a heads up that you hear. As the commotion was unfolding in the lobby, the crew four floors below were unaware of who was about to walk into their studio. So we do the first segment of the show, and Rick Radzik, who at the time was our assistant program director, he comes in this little side studio as Mark Bertrand is doing the Sports Hub headlines, and he pulls Mike and Tony off into the corner. I said, what's going on? And Jimmy Stewart, our producer, looks at me, and he said, Rick says John Henry's here. And Mike kind of just, you know, took his headphone off. I said, John Henry's here. He wants to come on the air right now. I think Mike thought I was joking. I didn't quite hear it right. Like, it didn't, it didn't register with me when he said that. I'm like, yeah. Mark's wrapping up his update. And we hit the rejoin. It's Felgrim Maserati. You may want to stay tuned. I think we're going to have a special guest in studio here coming very shortly. I don't know if I'm being put on or not, but it's a pretty big name. I remember thinking, okay, this is a gag. It never occurred to me that actually John Henry was in the building about to walk in the door. I was sort of taken aback and stunned by the whole thing. I'm like, what? From the time he got in and saw Dickman to the time he came downstairs, I don't know how much time had passed, but from our standpoint, it felt like this. Someone we've been talking a lot about the last couple weeks. So we'll see if we're gonna be joined by him or not, or if this is a joke. It is obviously not. Red Sox principal owner John Henry's joining us in studio right now, surprise visit. And I went, holy sh That's the owner of the Boston Red Sox, and he's pissed. It was not a joke, it was real. The owner of the Boston Red Sox had shown up on our doorstep to give his side of the story. The unthinkable somehow became reality. Rather than make an appearance on the radio network in partnership with his franchise, John Henry walked right into the laps of the competition. John, to what do we owe the pleasure? Well, when you're misleading the public, you know, you should be challenged on some of the things you're, you're saying. He came in hot. He was not happy. And the thing that he came in, I think, most hot about was previous references to his personal life, his multiple marriages, his current wife. Part of the whole story was Terry Francona was having marital problems and things of this nature. And we took that to say, oh, okay, well, marital problems are now on the table. I wonder what John Henry's marital situation's like. And so I think it was maybe his tipping point that the conversation had focused so much on him over the days following the Holer story. W with regard to Bob Holer, whom you I- believe, You believe we came out and smeared Tito. You believe that? Do I believe you specifically? I don't know who. I know team sources came out team and smeared sources. Tito. Yes. If it's someone with the t in the team, and that's what it says in the newspaper, well, then I'm very upset about it. When it came to blaming the owners of the Red Sox for airing out Terry Francona's personal life, John Henry was getting the brunt of the criticism. And so the thing he did repeatedly say was that the show was misleading the public in the things that Felger and Maz were saying. Were you just driving around listening to us? Yes. Okay. So that's why I'm here. You're putting words into my mouth 
which are misleading the public. So why shouldn't, I think it's great of you guys to allow me to come in and answer your questions. John, I say this from the heart, anytime. Like everybody else, we were blaming John Henry and Larry Lucchino for leaking that story. That was the feeling of a lot of fans, a lot of media, a lot of insiders. So that was a, a common thing. I don't think he liked the narrative. He was trying to argue, I think, that the Red Sox didn't leak the story. I still think we got it right. I mean, I have no doubt. Now, maybe it wasn't John Henry, maybe it was. But to me, the organization, and I use the term as all encompassing, they threw the manager under the bus after eight historic years. I thought that was as low as it gets. Besides trying to clear the Sox of strong accusations of leaking the story, Henry took the opportunity to go on the offensive about the substance of Felger and Maz's daily four-hour show. He got really caught up on the journalism versus entertainment. I feel like he was trying to really jab Felger and Maz with that. You know, I guess this isn't what you would call journalism. This is entertainment, right? Tony and I have had this discussion before about the difference between journalism and entertainment. And, he, and he's told me this is entertainment as opposed to journalism. And I feel like he thought he was going to upset them and annoy them and insult them by repeatedly saying that they were now entertainers and that they were no longer journalists. Yeah, guilty, uh, guilty. We like to say sometimes that our show isn't, it's not necessarily hard news. It's, it's based on, uh, you know, it's based on true events. So yeah, he's got a point. So look, Mike and I both worked in newspapers, albeit for a tabloid, for the majority of the time. And even in newspapers, there's a little bit of both. But I also think we, we kind of call it like we see it, which is to say, in this case, it was a smear campaign. As finishing touches were being put on the forthcoming TV simulcast studios, the Felger and Maz show was broadcasting in a makeshift side studio where they did some temporary decorating. One piece stood out. From where I was sitting around this L-shaped table, I had a pretty good view of everybody in the room. I was looking directly at John Henry. The other person who I knew had a direct line of sight to what was pinned on the wall behind John Henry, to John Henry's right, was Jimmy Stewart. I'm like, I gotta document this. Like, whether it be for social media or for something to prove that it's actually John Henry. So I just kind of took my phone and I just kind of like angled it so it wasn't obvious that I was taking a picture of him. Turns out it was obvious. Are you taking pictures <laughs> <laughs> to memorialize this moment? Of I sort of looked at Jimmy and gave him the eyes and sort of motioned with my eyes, the wall. Look at the wall, Jimmy. Jimmy, that picture is still on the wall. And it was John Henry and Linda Pizzuti, and their arms are locked, and they're eating ice cream cones together. It was he and Linda again. I can't remember were they married, engaged, just boyfriend, girlfriend. I don't remember, but uh, they were out where Italy. I don't know, back bay somewhere. They were having ice cream. It was just sort of a ridiculous photo, and someone put it up in the studio as just kind of a joke. And we were all really uncomfortable about like, oh my gosh, we're gonna take that down. I don't think he ever noticed it. I don't think he saw it. I'm glad he didn't because that would have been an awkward moment in trying to explain why that was on the wall. He sat right there and there was that picture over him of him licking the ice cream cone and I don't think he ever knew it. Even when the mics were off, tension remained high during Henry's visit. I absolutely okay. have to break. John, here's the deal. We take a commercial break. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you my philosophy while we're off the air. If you want to stay, I'm stay. If you want to go, stay, go. I'll stay. Excellent. And during that one break, John, Henry, and Maz go at it. My relationship with the Red Sox over the years has gone up and down, understandably. Uh, and I think anybody who covers the team would tell you that it usually goes that way. So there are going to be times where they like you and times where they don't. At that particular point in time, my relationship with them was not at one of the high points, it was one of the low points. And when we went to break, John Henry took off his headset and looked at Maz and went, what happened to you? <laughs> he said to him, what happened to you? I used to like you. And Maz was hot. He didn't like it. He didn't like being put on the spot like that. And he says, well, John, you know, I've reached out to you. I've tried to get in touch with you. Maz felt like it was a bit of a dig. 
off the air, what happened to you? I used to like you. It was, a, it was a tense moment there between those two guys and the break wasn't that long because a minute or two later we were back on the air and the interview continued. You know, we disagreed, it was contentious, but it wasn't hostile, If at, at least I don't think it was. Uh, you know, maybe other people's recollection of that is different than mine. But I, I felt like at the end of the day, we just all agreed to disagree. John Henry sat in the Sports Hub studios for over 70 minutes that day in 2011, but neither side seemed to budge in how they viewed the situation. I don't think there really was a resolution. I mean, I don't think there was a, okay, you're right. I think it was more of a case where everybody just wanted to be heard. And in his case in particular. I wish more people would come in and fight on the air with us because it's good for everybody. I think it's good for everybody. I think that when you get people in a room that disagree on something and their tension points, you can get some good information out of it, but it's also good entertainment for the audience. You know, there were other things that came out of it just beyond the Terry Francona thing. And, you know, it was, these are not the kinds of questions that typically would get answered at a press conference. And that, again, that's what made it unique. You have to understand, Larry Lucchino runs the Red Sox. Was Carl Crawford a baseball signing or a television rating signing? Definitely a baseball signing. I personally oppose that. Is it true that Beckett gained considerable weight during the year? That's one of the things we're looking at. Um, I would have loved for Theo to have been our general manager for the next 20 years, but you don't always get what you want. I don't think he hurt himself. I mean, I don't think he did himself any great favors, but I don't think he hurt himself either. But maybe in his eyes or someone else's eyes, he did, because we haven't heard, I don't know. He's obviously never done anything like that since. People right now are forgetting that this was a great team before September, and they're concentrating solely on September. And I don't blame them for that, but I love this team, and I'm going to do everything I can to get it back to where it, it needs to be. All right, John, seriously, don't be a stranger. Come on by any time. Doors always open. John Thank Henry. You. Appreciate it, John. Here on Felger and Maz on 98.5 The Sports Hub. Uh, we will take your reaction. We'll give you all reaction. Stick around. Don't go anywhere. It probably took 20 minutes until the next full break that we all sort of looked at each other and said, holy bleep. I can't believe that just happened. What did we do to deserve something so lucky? Like that, that's just, that's the kind of thing that... Uh, you dream of, and it, we were lucky enough to get it. We got him on the good day when he was in the car listening. Yeah, was it good radio? I think so. I mean, I think you'd be hard pressed not to because I know this, if I were at home listening, I would have stopped everything I was doing and started taking notes. From Super Bowls to Stanley Cups to World Series and everything in between, Felger and Maz have covered the biggest stories in sports, but this day is truly in a category unto its own. It just was so different. I mean, there are a lot of occasions where we're on the air and something happens, and it's not like the owner of the team walks in and sits in on a live show with you every day. If I'm known for anything, I'm known for a handful of things, and I'd say four of the five are bad. This is the one that isn't all that bad. And I, you know, I, I would say that that's, that's, uh, that's sort of nice to have mixed in there, that I did nothing wrong here, and it was just sort of a, a memorable moment. I didn't ask John Henry any questions that day. That was for Felger and Maz. It's their show, their names were on it. But I'm happy I was there for it. I'm happy I was a witness to it. I hadn't lived a moment where a person with that much power comes into the studio and just wants to correct all the wrongs that he thinks he has heard. So Mike and I have basically been on the air for 14 years together now. We've never had a day like that one. Two years later, Henry's Red Sox returned to baseball's promised land. Red Sox are in the World Series in 2013, and they have a World Series gala at Fenway Park. And I go there with Mark Bertrand. So that was the night before the World Series started in 2013. And he goes, oh, there's John Henry over there with uh, his wife, Linda. And Mark says, you should go over and talk to him go, you know what? I think I will. I think I'll go over there and talk to John Henry. So I go up to him. I reintroduce myself. I say, hey, I'm Jimmy Stewart from Felger and Maz, 985. Uh, would love for you to 
come back and crash the castle. And John Henry just like, he ramps up his anger and he says, no way, those guys are I'll never come back on that show. <laughs> that, that was what he said. Why would I want to go on with those a-holes? Why would I want to do that? And Jimmy laughed and I laughed. And the look of shock on Linda's face was amazing. He was still angry. And to use that terminology to describe anybody, yeah, he hates us. He hates us a lot. If Henry does in fact hate them, the hosts aren't losing sleep over it. I think most people that we cover and talk about in this town, I'd say the vast majority have a poor opinion of us. So that is not unusual. It's not unusual for him uh, to have a poor opinion of us. I, you know, I think we all have an understanding of how the town works from a media standpoint and from a, a fan passion standpoint. The, the whole fellowship of the miserable is, I think, entertaining sports radio and I think is one of the great things about this town is that how miserable and negative Red Sox fans used to be and could be. So we've tried to carry on that tradition. I don't think he quite sees the, uh, the cuteness in that like we do, how cute it is to bash the Red Sox. So, you know, I, I don't think he looks fondly on that day. Uh, he probably hates us like poison. He's not alone from people in, in, in this town that we cover. And so uh, I have no problem with that.